can we also do here is let's hide this. Yeah, thank you, and get rid of that. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, thanks. Okay. Um, so it is uh, my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the speaker this uh, this noon. Uh, and uh, Dan uh, Brudney is speaking. Dan is the Florin Harrison Pugh Professor in the Department of Philosophy and the College at the University of Chicago. He is also an, an assistant director of the McLean Center and an associate faculty member in the Divinity School. Um, I think many of us know Professor Brudney well, but for those who don't, uh, he's a graduate of Harvard University where he received both his BA and his PhD in philosophy. Um, he writes and teaches in political philosophy, bioethics, and philosophy and literature. His recent publications include Decisional Capacity, Two Philosophical Problems, The Theory Rawls, uh, the 1844 Marx and the Market, and Nostromo and Negative Longing. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Brudney is a long-standing member of the faculty of the McLean Center, and um, he has uh, provided really uh, thoughtful insights at our weekly ethics case conference for many years and he's had a really major impact on the clinical ethics education of literally hundreds of McLean uh, ethics fellows. And so it's a real pleasure uh, to welcome Dan. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Delighted to be here. It's good to see a bunch of faces I know. Um, so I'm gonna do what philosophers do, which is I'm gonna read the paper and. If I remember, since I'm a philosopher, I might forget, I'll keep uh, the slides rolling. So in his um, 1908 book, um, Pragmatism, William James writes, whenever a dispute is serious, we ought to be able to show some practical difference that might follow from one side or the others being right. I suspect that today I'm going to disappoint William James. What I have to say is highly unlikely to make a practical difference, at least not in the sense of changing anyone's clinical practice. What I hope to do, yeah, can, can't hear? How's that? Better? Yes? Okay. What I hope to do, may, and you know, you'll decide whether this counts as making some kind of a difference, is to pro provide you with a broader conceptual context for clinical practice. I'll eventually be making some remarks about medical assent, mostly in the pediatric context, as distinct from medical consent. Um, and there's an obvious puzzle about medical assent. Um, to seek it seems misguided. Uh, after all, the criteria for decision-making capacity are not arbitrary. I doubt that there's fundamental disagreement about whether, say, the standard criteria, say, the Berg, Applebaum, Grisso criteria, are more or less correct. Uh, and if they're correct, then patients who fail to meet these criteria just don't have decision-making capacity. And so they shouldn't get input. And by hypothesis, anyone for whom, for whom we're seeking assent, not consent, has failed to meet those criteria. Yet, from observing pediatricians, I have the strong intuition that a patient that they believe that a patient who lacks capacity should still have some kind of input into the medical decision-making process. Now, this concern might be merely instrumental. Getting assent might reduce patient resistance to treatment. Still, I think that in seeking patient assent, clinicians often believe that something moral and not merely instrumental is at stake. I want to talk about what might justify that belief. As a philosopher, my interest here is that the puzzle about medical assent elicits fundamental questions about what it is to possess great value, specifically as a human being, and to be in certain valuable relationships simply as a human being. And the claims that a human being possesses such value and ought to be in such relationships are crucial to the patient choice model of clinical ethics. That model is our current model, and it needs periodic interrogation because, like seeking assent, at first glance, it's quite peculiar. The practice of medicine is about helping people. It's about the promotion of individual human good. Yet the current model does not prioritize individual human good, it prioritizes patient choice. Okay, you might claim that patient choice is the root to the patient's good, but I think as all you clinicians know better 
than I, it's not always a reliable route. Moreover, recent work in behavioral economics casts considerable doubt on the link between patient choice and the patient's good. So that's why it's important that the current model is supposed to be justified by other moral values, values that in principle might be in particular cases more important than the individual human good. That last claim is both practically important and philosophically interesting. It also points to what's at stake with assent. Sometimes seeking assent will help to figure out what's best for the child, but for the most part, if all we cared about was the child's good, there'd be no, little role for assent. Procedural values and not substantive values are actually at stake. So when a patient wants a medical option that's not likely to realize their own best interests or in philosopher's lingo, their own good, there's a conflict between, between procedural and substantive values. The current model normally accords priority to procedural values, to patient choice or with sur surrogate decision-making to substituted judgment. I'm sure this claim is only roughly true in practice, but it's true enough to make one wonder why this is actually the right model to follow. So today I wanna to do two things that in a way are going to be in tension with one another. I want to extract and puzzle over a pair of values and a pair of relationships that I take to be central to the patient choice model. And I also want to invoke precisely those values and those relationships, values and relationships that I'm going to claim are philosophically questionable to note some reasons that would justify seeking pediatric assent. I'm going to start by pointing out that in philosophical terms, our current model is rather fragile. Yet I wanna be clear about the force of such claim. Back in my graduate student days, my dissertation advisor once remarked that the only thing we can be confident of about any philosophical theory is that it's wrong. I suspect that the same applies to any model for medical decision-making. Indeed, it's a feature of doing specifically applied moral philosophy that one doesn't necessarily look for the absolutely best alternative. I might be right that the current clinical model has its problems, even significant problems, and yet that model might, that model might still be superior to any available alternative. That's why I think the apparent tension in my talk is only apparent. What I have to say today could be taken as a prolegomenon, to use a philosophical word, to tweaking the current model, yet not necessarily. Nothing that I say will entail that we should engage in tweaking the model, let alone in wholesale changes. That's why I think my predecessor in philosophy, William James, is gonna be disappointed in me. To put the point differently, in clinical ethics, as in other areas of applied philosophy, what we really need is a theory of the second best to take us away from large philosophical uncertainties and disputes and to provide us with a model that is both minimally or sufficiently morally acceptable and also sufficiently operational. That, however, is a talk for another day. What I'll be saying today is tentative and first draftish. I hope that there's going to be serious challenge on many points. Of course, I'm a philosopher and in keeping with my particular form of professional deformation, Today's talk is gonna be pretty abstract. I do hope you'll bear with me. I think abstraction is necessary in this area if we're to go beyond mere catchphrases. Now, let's see if I can get this right. Some bioethicists seem to me to dodge the deeper issues by perhaps unconsciously indulging in catchphrases. Phrases. To take an example, one writer notes that now quoting, most pediatric bioethicists and clinicians are quite comfortable applying Kant's moral imperative. Children should never be treated as means only, but always also as ends in themselves, unquote. Now Kant does believe this, and perhaps it's even true that we shouldn't treat a human being as a mere means. But if this thought is true, you might think it would be good to know why it's true. Um, you might think it would be good to know what there is about a human being that makes it the kind of being that should not be treated as a mere means. Knowing this might help us to know what kinds of actions to avoid. In fact, as I'll repeat a little later, children are a problem here because they don't seem to possess full rational nature, which is the specific thing that Kant himself believes should never be treated as a mere means. Indeed, it could be argued that any patient who fails to meet the standard for decisional capacity is vulnerable to being said not to possess full rational nature. 
So on one way of taking Kant and his talk about treating others as uh, ends in themselves and not mere means, no patient without capacity is the kind of being we should treat as an end in themselves and not as a mere means. So if you do believe that no patient should be treated as a mere means, I think we ought to try to understand why not. Okay, now to the body of my paper. Let's start with the Berg, Applebaum, and Grisso criteria for decision of capacity. They are, as you all know, first, the ability to communicate a choice. Second, the ability to understand relevant information. Third, the ability to appreciate the nature of the situation and its likely consequences. And fourth, the ability to manipulate information rationally. Note that these refer only to cognitive capacities along with one communicative capacity. The guiding thought seems to be that patients should understand the medical situation to some threshold level of understanding, understand that it's their medical situation, that seems to be the usual interpretation of the appreciation criterion, and they should be able to state or in some other way make sufficiently evident which of the proposed medical options they prefer. Now these criteria are value-free in the sense that they seem not to exclude any specific value. On the usual gloss, it's merely a matter of what the patient prefers or desires. Morally speaking, patient preferences or desires are supposed to rule the day. So the philosopher is going to enter here and ask why a patient's preference or desire, and I'm going to from now on use these terms interchangeably, should rule the day. Why should satisfying the capacity criteria and having this or that desire be sufficient to make it morally correct to allow a patient to make an egregiously foolish and even self-destructive medical decision. What's so great about having a bit of knowledge coupled with a desire? This might seem to be a classic case of a little knowledge being a dangerous thing. So I'm raising this issue because here too, bioethicists sometimes don't push as far as they should. For instance, Mark Navin and Jason Wasserman argue that the reason to ask for pediatric assent is that children are often capable of forming and articulating what they call preferences. About this, I'm, merely, I'm going to now merely repeat what philosophers have long noted. Preferences or desires can be transient, arbitrary, and trivial. My desire for world peace is a desire for something intrinsically good. My desire for a large slice of chocolate cake is also for something good. Maybe less good than world peace, and depending on my health, perhaps also not really so good, my desire that my lifelong rival suffer severely and perpetually is a desire for something bad. It looks like whether my desire ought to be satisfied depends on the goodness or badness of its content, not on the fact that I have it. Now, a standard response would be that in pursuing my desire, at least for the clinical ethics, I'm exercising my will, and that I have a moral right not to be interfered with in the exercise of my will unless that exercise harms someone. There's surely something to this, but keep in mind two things about the value of non-interference with the pursuit of a, of a desire. First, we constantly, at least I do, constantly interfere with our pet's desires. I'm assuming those of you with pets do all the time. And we think we're right to do so. If non-interference with human desires is important, there must be something to distinguish them from, say, my dog's desires. There must be something about the human will that makes my pursuit of my human desires different. And second, in clinical contexts, non-interference in the most basic sense is at stake only when the issue is whether to compel treatment. It's not at stake when the issue is whether to proceed with the treatment the patient has asked for. After all, when the patient asks for treatment T, one could respect the value of non-interference by doing nothing. Non-interference is a negative claim. If the capaci capacitated patient's desire makes a positive claim for treatment of some kind, we need to understand why. So we have to say something about specifically human choice, which means we have to say something about human action. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about action. Aristotle notes that human action is inevitably oriented towards some conception of what's good. There's an idea of the good or of some aspect of the good behind every action. Aristotle's thought, which is an obvious thought, is that when we act, we believe there's a sufficient reason to do this particular action here and now. And that reason sooner or late 
or later bottoms out in the belief that the action in question is pointing toward what we think is good. We're inevitably exercising, well or badly, what philosophers call practical reason. So I'm gonna expand on this briefly. First, the thought refers to every action being driven by the belief that it's tied to something good, at least in the long run. However, in a given case, the belief in question might be mistaken. I often act on mistaken belief about what's good. I sometimes take a goal to be good, which isn't good. And I sometimes take an incompetent means to something that is good, and so I fail to attain it. There are many ways in which my practical reason goes wrong. Aristotle's point is simply that human action is only intelligible when it's seen as pointing to pursuing something that the agent believes rightly or wrongly to be good. Otherwise, we just can't make sense of what the agent is doing. We can't make sense of why they are doing what they are doing. Now, the claim that we act for a reason applies not only to adults, but to children past a certain modest age. Take William Carlos Williams' famous story, The Use of Force, about a girl with diphtheria who does not want to open her mouth. There's a lot going on in that story, but what I want to highlight is that, and I'm sure all of you know it, especially you pediatricians, um, in the battle of wills between the child and the pediatrician, it would be wrong simply to say that the girl merely has a preference to keep her mouth closed. Williams describes her as concealing a secret and is waging a battle. She has her reasons, and a part of what makes the violation involved in forcibly opening her mouth a violation of a human will of a reason-giving capacity is that she has those things. And also, this is all, I think, very different from what goes on when I try to give my dog his medicine. So as I've said, when we speak of reason for action, there are reasons and there are reasons. Some are good, some are bad. Such goodness or badness might be tracked along several different dimensions. Here I want to note two broad and purely formal categories of reasons for action. To see the difference between these categories, let's look at a pair of hypothetical patients. I take the first from a book with which you're all familiar, Johnson, Siegler, and Winslade, Clinical Ethics. The second, we'll see in a moment, is my own invention, but it's a standard Jehovah's Witness example. So here's the first example. The patient is a 24-year-old graduate student. He comes voluntarily to the emergency room. Previously in excellent health, he's complaining of a severe headache and stiff neck. Examination of spinal fluid leads to a diagnosis of bacterial meningitis. Administration of antibiotics is recommended. When he's told his diagnosis and that he'd be admitted to the hospital for treatment with antibiotics, the, tr the patient refuses further care. The physician explains the extreme dangers of going untreated, risk of death or permanent disability, and the minimal risk of treatment. The young man persists in his refusal, citing merely the fact that he deeply hates shots. Other than this strange aversion, he exhibits no evidence of mental derangement or altered mental status that would suggest decisional incapacity. And then for the second example, this is a 56-year-old devout Jehovah's Witness. She's read broadly in and believes deeply in witness theology. She's lived her life in accordance with the witness precepts, and she sees a substantial part of the meaning and value of her life as tied up with her witness identity, and so with compliance with the requirements of that identity. She now needs a major operation in order to survive, but the operation can't be done without significant use of the kind of blood products that witness theology proscribes. Therefore, she has refused the operation. Now, in both cases, it would be possible to help the patient, perhaps even to save the patient's life by compelling treatment. When I use these examples in classes, and those of you who've been in my class have heard them, um, there are some people in the class who say it would be morally justified to administer antibiotics to the graduate student without his consent. Anybody here? Be bold. Anybody ready to compel consent there? Come on. Yeah, yeah, okay. His back is turned, he's sleeping. You're really good with a needle, he won't even know. Yes, a few. Maybe, maybe, okay. Um, very few say that it would be justified to operate on the Jehovah's Witness without her consent. Anybody for that one? No. And even those who say that compelled treat treatment would be morally wrong in both cases tend to be a little bit more conflicted about the graduate student case. So there seems to be a difference between the cases. Now, 
Compelled surgery is a greater inversion of the body than a compelled injection. But I don't think that that, that distinction is what accounts for the difference in responses. I think the difference in responses stems from the fact that while both cases involve the issue of overriding the patient's will, or as I'll put it, the patient's agency, only the witness case also involves violating, from her point of view, deeply undermining a central part of what the patient sees as giving her life meaning. It, it violates what I'm going to call her authenticity. Now, I'm not really keen on the labels agency and authenticity. Other writers have used other labels to get at the same distinction. The central point, whatever the label, is that there's a diff difference between interfering with the choice of a moment and interfering with a vision of how to live. The graduate student is refusing treatment for a reason. He doesn't want an injection. He is exercising his will. Kant would put it that he's setting himself the end to not have an injection. He's not being causally pushed around by his desire not to have an injection. He's taking the fact that he has this desire, the desire not to have an, an injection, to be a sufficient reason not to have one. He thinks it's good to refuse it. Still, this is a one-off. By hypothesis, the refusal here has not tied to, to any large and for him pervasive vision of the meaning of life. By contrast, in the case of the witness, the refusal of surgery is precisely tied to such a vision. When I refer to such a larger vision, it's not easy to nail down what kind of phenomenon is involved. Bernard Williams, a great philosopher, uh, argues that human beings have what he calls ground projects, the central projects that give their life purpose and meaning. John Rawls, following another earlier philosopher, Josiah Royce, talks of agents as having life plans. Um, I didn't put up on the slide, but Hollywood says that you should follow your dream, where this is supposed to be not merely something that you prefer, but something you find important to, crucial to your sense of who you are. These things, a ground project, a life plan, a dream, they might not be precisely identical, but they point to the fact that much human action isn't a one-off. It's rather part of a relatively extensive view of what makes one's life a good life. Human beings have both the capacity to exercise the will and the capacity to form, to endorse, to pursue, and occasionally to revise a life plan. Now, here things get tricky, and for more than one reason. These capacities have a complicated relation to the patient's best interests, to the patient's good. So note a couple of things. First, each capacity is formal in the sense that it can be pursued, exercised rather, in the pursuit of what is bad as well as what's good. I exercise my will just as much when I act foolishly or wickedly as when I act intelligently or virtuously. Similarly, my life plan is just as much a life plan when it's foolish or wicked as when it's intelligent or virtuous. Nevertheless, second thing to note, the exercise of these formal capacities might to be thought to be constitutive of at least part of a patient's overall good. It's normally good not to have one's will controlled by others and not just for instrumental reasons. There's some intrinsic value in the idea, you're not the boss of me. That's supposed to be something that some of us want to say often enough. As for authenticity, it's tied to the concept of individualism. Yet the celebration of individualism is of relatively recent vintage. It's hard to date these sorts of things in the history of ideas, but we might date its prevalence as a major value to around the time of the 19th century romantics. Even then, the value was decisively rejected by many at the time by, say, the contemporary Puritans, for whom the exercise of your own vision was exactly a form of the kind of disobedience to God's law that got us in trouble. Even now, there are traditional societies that would reject the goal of following your dream. The point is that authenticity has not always been thought to be basic to the human good. Part of the complicated relation between authenticity and the good can perhaps be seen in the case of an elderly man. We saw this case a few weeks ago. Call him Frank. He's got increasing dementia and an anger-prone personality. He has no family or friends. If after a hospital stay, he's returned to the apartment where he lives alone, there's considerable risk that he'll fall or that he'll fail to take his medication or in some other way, he'll be injured or even die. 
However, if he's sent to a nursing facility, they'd likely put him in physical or chemical restraints because of his tendency to anger, and that seems like an awful existence. If someone could exercise substituted judgment, perhaps it would be clear that Frank believes that his good involves living and maybe even dying at home by himself. And we might even think that because Frank believes this, living and maybe dying at home by himself would be better for him than being sent to a nursing facility. But in the absence of anyone who can affirm that Frank takes his own good to involve going home, the apparently sensible thing to do, and my memory is that's what was done, is to send him to the nursing facility on the grounds that given what we know, doing so is in his best interests. What I want you to note is that what's going on, on here is not that Frank's belief about his own good makes going home better for him. His belief about the good does not make it so. My belief about the good does not determine my good any more than my belief about the sun rising tomorrow makes it rise. Rather, we believe in the procedural good of living in accordance with one's own values. And if we could invoke that procedural good in Frank's case, doing so might tip the value scale and overall make it better for him to go home. My reason for going through these features of agency and authenticity is that these values are so frequently invoked and so frequently instantiated at the bedside that we can overlook the fact that a moral commitment to either of them, let alone to both, is a very heavy duty and suspect commitment. Let's start with agency. Almost everyone would accept that agency has some value, but not everyone would accept that it has the overriding value accorded it by our clinical ethics model. So here's the philosopher Richard Arneson. Voluntary choice is important, but does not plausibly have make or break significance. It's a mistake to make a fetish of voluntary choice. It remains the case that, that sometimes a hard coercive shove away from the bad can improve anyone's life. Go back to our graduate student. Arneson clearly would think that balancing continued life, maybe 50 years of good life, against overriding the, age, the, the student's agency very, very briefly to give him a quick coercive shove um, would be clearly better to do. Now, I will say Arneson is an act utilitarian. And so he's acting, he's judging in accordance with act utility. But what's to be noted here is that the priority that we give at the bedside to the exercise of the patient's will is something which maybe it's the right thing to do, but it's not obviously the right thing to do simply because it falls under a widely accepted moral principle. On the contrary, there are widely accepted moral principles that would say it's sometimes the wrong thing to do. As for authenticity, that's the value that I think undermines a commitment to using substituted judgment in surrogate decision-making. And to repeat, it too is disputable. Some current philosophers reject it or at least insist that it has serious value only when the agent's beliefs more or less track the truth and the agent's values are more or less reasonable. For instance, Joseph Roz insists that authenticity is valuable only if exercised in the pursuit of what is actually good, not what you believe or the patient believes to be good, but what's good. He's not impressed, Roz is not impressed, with the idea of following your dream merely because it's your dream. Philosophers sometimes make lists of valuable things and activities. That's, say, of basic human goods. So let me go through sort of what they found, or at least mention them. The scholar Mark Murphy gives the list. He's a natural law theorist. He gives the list of fundamentally valuable things provided by seven philosophers committed to the tradition of natural law. I won't go through it all, but I want to note that of those seven philosophers, each of whom has you know, six or eight or 10 valuable things, only one lists authenticity among the things that are fundamentally good. The philosopher Derek Far Parfit, who has a famous objective list, good of what's, list of what's good, doesn't include it at all. Um, our own Martha Nussbaum across the midway um, um, who has developed a thing called the capabilities approach for human flourishing. Um, she does include practical reason in the list of capabilities that whose exercise is crucial to human flourishing, but she also includes lots of other things. And she provides no priority rules to decide conflicts among these capacities. Now, there are some philosophers who would be on the side of authenticity. Ronald Dworkin, for instance, was a big proponent. But to give you a feeling for the issue that goes beyond just invoking names of philosophy professors, let's take a patient with anorexia nervosa. 
Suppose the patient truly believes that being thin is more important than extended life. Her life plan embodies this belief. Should we let her starve herself to death? Yeah, I know. In practice, it might be very difficult to save such a patient's life for very long. Perhaps the patient's right against bodily invasion is sufficient to prevent forced feeding, especially if the forced feeding has to be done repeatedly. But those last two considerations are very different from the substantive claim that the patient's judgment about her own good and the authentic life it might generate, regardless of its content, has overriding moral weight. That's a big claim, and it needs a big argument to support it. In the case of the patient with um, anorexia nervosa myself, I think that claim is absolutely false. But one further point. As I say, the value of authenticity is what justifies using substituted judgment. There's evidence, of course, that surrogates are not good at knowing what the patient would have wanted. Put that aside. There's reason also to think that the patient, that is, a human being, it's not especially transparent to herself. Yeah, put that aside as well. What I want to note is that the value of authenticity seems to rest on a metaphysical premise that's not obviously true. Here's a way to see the point. One thought about substituted judgment might be that it's supposed to continue the patient's story, the narrative of their life. The goal is to maintain the unity of the patient's life. But this assumes ex ante that the patient has a single determinate story or a single determinate picture of their life. Now, this could be true with some patients, say with our Jehovah's Witness patient. However, with many of us, the narrative unity of our life is generated retrospectively. At some point, I go down path alpha rather than beta, and now, years later, that's the story of my life. I can't now imagine myself as a person who doesn't have the very specific children that I have. But supposing that I hadn't met my wife. Okay. Now, I wouldn't be able to imagine myself without other specific children. Um, that can be true for many of the choices that we make. We make them perhaps tentatively, perhaps they're even forced on us in various ways. And then we go down that road, and that's who we become. And the idea that there's some being ex ante that's already there, well, maybe. But that's, again, the kind of premise you better argue for. Um, Peter Strawson, another great philosopher, notes that a person's ideal of life, the thing that's supposed to be generating this thought that you have a vision that you are pursuing, often changes dramatically over time, possibly over a relatively short period of time. So the concept of authenticity relies on what might be a very suspect metaphysics. Um, and if many of us um, are not merely ignorant of ourselves, but are changeable creatures, without much of an essence, if that's the kind of being a human being is, authenticity might go out the window, and then what's our basis for substituted judgment? Okay, quick summary of the last section of the talk. How am I doing for time? Okay, I think. So in our modern world, we think that there's intrinsic value to facilitating the patient's, patient's agenticity, agenticity, no, just agency and authenticity. Um, these provide us with moral bases for the various steps of the patient choice model. Maybe such values are justifiable, maybe they're suspect. But, and now I'm gonna to pivot to talking about assent. These are scalar capacities. One could have them to some degree, even if one doesn't have them to whatever is considered to be threshold for sufficient possession of these capacities. The capacity to determine what counts as a sufficient reason to, to do or not to do action A, or to pursue or not to pursue long-term plan P is something that develops over time and comes in degrees. It's partly that the actual content of our values develops over time. That's true and important. Beyond that, the very ability to think about what to do in a reasoned way also develops over time. The ability to weigh competing values, to understand the trade-offs in a life plan, that too develops over time. My claim, and I assume this will not strike any pediatrician as controversial, is that a major reason to seek patient child assent is that these two valuable capacities exist to differing degrees in patients without decisional capacity, say children. To seek pediatric assent is, is a way to register the no doubt limited but actual presence of these valuable capacities. Now, I'm not at all qualified to say when children have either of these capacities 
to the point that it becomes appropriate to seek assent, I want merely to note a couple of things. First, although my focus today is on children, much of, much of what I have to say can apply to adult patients who have lost capacity. Such patients might have some degree of capacity for agency and authenticity. Discussing authenticity, Agnes Jaworska gives an example of an elderly man with considerable dementia who wishes to buy a pickup truck. He doesn't have capacity, but he has a reason for wanting to buy the truck. It's part of his picture of what the good life involves. A man needs his truck, he's reported as saying. Clearly, his all things considered good does not involve buying the truck. His decision maker is, not to, is right not to do so. But there does remain here an element of the man's good, his quest to lead a life in accordance with his beliefs and values that's being overridden. And there's a cost, therefore, to denying him this. Second, another kind of example, one might think that in scarce life-saving resource situations, the kind we've recently had, other things being equal, the morally proper thing to do would be to give the scarce life-saving resource, say, a vaccination to the youngest child. So now we're imagining a different situation than the, than the COVID pandemic. Doing so, giving whatever the resource is to the long, youngest child would maximize the number of overall life years that would be saved. In fact, in the recent literature on the topic, this is pre-pandemic, some writers disagree. They urge that priority should be given to adolescents. They claim that the older children, but not the younger children have, and they use the words projects, have something akin to life plans. These writers then add that it's worse to lose the opportunity to pursue one's already formed projects, to pursue one's life plans than simply to lose more years of life. We prevent more harm, they say, by enabling the older children to continue with their projects. Now, I mentioned this literature not to wrestle with the substantive question here, but just to show that some writers are convinced that the concept of a project, the concept of authenticity does indeed apply to some pediatric patients and in certain contexts, it can be given significant weight. Okay, I've been talking about morally relevant capacities, but there's a different way to approach the issue of assent. This would be to focus on certain morally relevant features of the patient-clinician relationship. So now I wanna talk about respect. It's constantly said that the, that the clinician must respect the patient. Unfortunately, this concept opens up yet another philosophical can of worms. Respect is an attitude, and like most attitude, it's, it's an attitude with an object. However, that object can be of different kinds and so can amount to different kinds of respect. In baseball, a batter might respect the pitcher's curveball, but that's not the kind of respect we have in mind in the clinical situation. When ta Kahn talks of respect for the humanity in a person, he means respect, as I say, for rational nature. And what he means is that I'm to treat the rational nature in a person in a certain way, not merely instrumentally, as when I have to think about whether to swing at that curveball, but intrinsically. The fact that, I, that a patient jack is, is respectworthy makes a moral claim on me that restricts the ways that I'm permitted to treat jack. Now for the can of worms. It looks as if I need to determine what the feature of jack is that makes a moral claim on me, the feature that entitles jack to respect. When Kant refers to, to um, rational nature, he seems to mean our practical rational capacities. So assume Kant means, or maybe he should mean, the two practical capacity that, that I've just been discussing. So let's assume that possession of these capacities is sufficient to be entitled to respect of a certain kind. Unfortunately, although possession of these capacities can be a matter of greater or lesser degree, respect seems to be an on or an off thing. We either respect somebody or you don't. Um, and since by hypothesis, children, keeping to that example, don't have the two key capacities to a sufficient degree, they don't have the capacities to the threshold degree of an adult, maybe it would follow that they're not entitled to respect. But that seems clearly wrong. Consider also that adults who are severely cognitively disabled don't have these rational capacities to a sufficient degree, they might have them to a very limited degree. On the premises just given, such people seem to be excluded from respect. But if children and adults who are cognitively disabled are excluded from respect, then they are excluded from the moral and practical protection that being respected involves. And as I say, most of us think that's profoundly wrong. It's a conclusion that I think we should deny. So that's one horn of the philosophical dilemma. To grasp the other horn of the dilemma, 
would be to reject the focus on rational capacities, but instead to say that the respect worthy property here is simply being human. One says that any human being is entitled to respect, period. On this strategy, we don't need to search for any morally relevant proper property other than you're human. Now, this will handle the, successfully the cases that I just mentioned. Any being with a certain genetic constitution gets to be respected. On the other hand, this looks like mere table thumping, or if you want to be in the Peter Singer realm, it's going to be speciesist. It gives moral priority to human beings over other human beings for no other reason than that we're just human, period. But offhand, one might think that we should be able to say something that explains why human beings are entitled to respect, something that a member of a different species, say dolphins, or if you like, Klingons, um, could ultimately have. But what would that property be such that literally all human beings have it? No one has yet proposed a plausible property, a property that all human beings have to a sufficient degree, and that's intuitively respect entitled, entitling. The journals have been chewing on this for a long, long time, called the problem of personhood. Um, you run into it, obviously, in the debates about abortion. There's sufficient exhaustion with the problem that there's currently a movement to get rid of the very concept of personhood. The thought is that we should focus on the cases that don't fit the personhood model and to the ones that we think nonetheless entitle people to proper treatment and respect and take those cases as our moral paradigms. I'm not going to get into this tangled literature because, first of all, it's precisely the status of non-capacitated patients such as um, children that drives the concern with rejecting personhood. And because, second, and this is the important thing, if we reject personhood, we're going to be rejecting a basic plank of the clinical model. That's really what's going on when you're talking about, say, agency and authenticity. These are supposed to be things that are features of persons distinctively. Um, so to get rid of personhood as a concept would be to put the model in question. Okay, one last relationship and then I'll be done. This will be quick. I wanna close today's talk by talking about trust. It's a very puzzling concept. In ordinary language, the term is used in multiple ways. At times we use the term to refer to mere rational reliance, that is to believing and maybe to acting on the basis of what we take to be the probabilities. At other times, to trust refers to believing or to acting in the space that remains once all probabilities have been left behind. There's a large difference between saying, I trust Jill because she has behaved well many times in the past, and just saying, I trust Jill, even though I have little or no experience of Jill. If you like, we could call trust that goes beyond rational reliance, pure trust. Usually I'm simply going to refer to trust. My interest is in the clinical relationship of trust that involves the patient committing to the clinician's care with a confidence that goes beyond what rational reliance would warrant. I want to be clear that such an attitude of trust, what I've called pure trust, um, that one person might have in another is neither rational nor irrational. That's because, as I say, it obtains when we're no longer in a position for rational assessment, be it pro or con. Uh, I'm going to digress to a brief personal example. I had knee surgery last year. I consult, Peter knows this because I talked to him about it. I consulted surgeon A, I consulted surgeon B. The outcome data for each were excellent. So were the references. But I trusted surgeon A and I didn't trust B. Yet this trust and distrust was the result of a pair of 15 minute encounters. I needed the surgery, that was clear, I had to make the choice. Now my choice to go with surgeon A was rational in the sense that there was no reason not to choose A. But the, choose A, but the evidence to choose A over B, the actual evidence was pretty close to equipoise. The data, the scale rather, was tipped by trust. My trust in A over B had something to do with data, namely my impressions of each. But keep in mind that this decision was not a trivial decision and that my rational reliance data here consisted um, in a very short conversation with the surgeon. It's hard to see such data as rationally dictating one choice over the other. Of course, as I say, my decision wasn't unwarranted. Well, in my epistemic situation, the basis for rational reliability had run out. 
Um, okay, that's just to point out that pure trust involves an epistemic leap. Everything, as you can see, I'm walking around fine, it all worked out. There's something else to note about trust. It brings into play a specific set of moral emotions. Trust involves a belief in someone's commitment to your well-being or a belief in their commitment to do their best for you. That's why I can feel disappointed when it rains on my picnic, but not betrayed when I trusted the weather and things turned out badly. However, if I learn that my surgeon shows up in the OR inebriated or otherwise not ready to do her best, I would feel not merely disappointed, but betrayed. We might think of trust as establishing a vulnerability relationship between patient and clinician. So turning to the pediatric context, the trust relationship there takes a particular form. In that context, the patient does not have decisional capacity. And that means that more than the patient, that means more than the patient doesn't actually make the decision. It means that the patient is not in a position to have the adult's kind of rational reliance on outcome likelihoods. I've said that pure trust enters at the point when epistemic assessment runs out. I suspect that in the pediatric context, that point is reached much sooner than in the adult context. There's much more room for, indeed more, much more of an inevitable need for trust on the part of the child. So seeking assent involves asking the child patient to trust the clinician. Now, what I've said about that is just descriptive. So the question is, is pure trust a valuable relationship? I've called it a vulnerability relationship. Does that make it something good, bad, or indifferent? It's worth noting that in the long philosophical tradition, starting with Socrates, there's been a great emphasis on being self-sufficient, on not needing others, on not being in vulnerability relationships. So it doesn't go, you know, it's, it, we shouldn't take for granted that being in such relationships is a good thing. Um, however, my inclination is to say that a trust relationship is in fact normally something valuable, that it's good when human beings trust one another, not merely, and that this is not merely instrumentally good, but intrinsically so. I think such relationships are valuable for their own stake, but for their own stake, for their own sake. Um, but this is a value claim and it's gonna hit bottom somewhere and I have no argument for it. You guys are gonna have to judge whether you wanna go with the tradition and think that it's suspect. Now trust obviously has its dangers, um, if, for instance, things go badly in the surgery or in the treatment with the child, the child might feel betrayed and that might undermine their trust in the future. Um, and so, as you all know better than I, um, any vulnerability relationship um, could go wrong. I really want to leave enough time for questions, so I'm going to bring this to a close. I want to note just one last thing about trust. Informed consent model seems to me to be hostile to trust. It's really about rational reliability. It's ideal seems to me to, for the patient to have ever more information and thus to be ever more in a position to make a rational, that is a probabilistic judgment about what to do. Pure trust as I've talked about it, that's beyond rational reliability is really what went into the, into the paternalist model. And to the extent that it's still around, that it's still an inevitable feature of the clinical relationship, I think it's the last residue of that model. Um, I was gonna finish by just summing up and going over things, but I've gone on long enough. So let me call this to a close. I want merely to sort of note that as I said, the structure of the talk has been first to put into question basic features of our current clinical model. And then nonetheless, to suggest that some of those features are part of what actually makes it rational to, or makes it good and proper to ask pediatric patients for assent. Um, so there is this tension. I think that's something we've got to live with. That is, I think the clinical, the current model has lots of potential problems. And, uh, but until we find an alternative, which maybe we should be look, looking for, um, we should be living with it. And it does have aspects to it that makes sense, so on, th saying of the practice of asking for assent. Okay, questions, please. No, it's a philosophy talk. Come on, guys, have some questions.
So one way to describe what's going on is to say that your patients lack decisional capacity by say the standard criteria. And that means that they lack an element of practical reason, namely ability to understand what's actually going on sufficiently well. Another way would be to say that this shows a limit to the value of something like authenticity. That, that, that um, they may be able to say, you know, in, in one sense, as with say the patient with anorexia nervosa, to be able to say, I know what's going on, I know exactly what's going on. But you might think, well, Valuable as acting in accordance with your own life plans might be, it doesn't have overriding value in all situations. And you were making the judgment that, in fact, this was one of those situations. Yeah. 
Well, that, I mean, again, part of what the philosopher can do with a model that, that we have is to ask, the model seems to say that certain kinds of values always take priority in a certain context, right? If the patient has capacity, that's supposed to be the end of the story. Um, and maybe that's right, but we take for granted that those values are genuinely always overriding and that everyone agrees that they're always overriding. And that's simply not the case. That's not, certainly not been the case in the philosophical tradition. Um, and it's even not the case in the philosophical literature now. Now, as I say, you have to have a plan B if you're going to say plan A um, needs to be rejected. I'm All that I'm pressing is, you might say I'm pressing the thought that we've had the current model for about two generations. That's not very long. That, you know, the other model, the paternalist model went way back. We're just figuring out how this one works. And frankly, I think as far as substituted judgment goes, that's even shorter because it's only been relatively recently that, you know, we've kept patients alive in such a way that this has been, that there's been a need to answer the question, what do we do now? So uh, all that, like, if, if there's something I'm hoping to sort of stir, it's the thought that these are not values that should be taken for granted as always um, the things that we need to abide by, that there's room to think about whether uh, a slightly or even significantly different model should be concocted. Please. You permitted or committed her? You committed her, okay. Right. So a case like that you know, it's, it's presumably part of what can make these decisions so difficult. And I think of this when in case conference, we often are talk, trying to find out what would the patient have wanted? Where it's just often not clear to me that that's the right question to ask. Um, and, there, and that, you know, the patient, again, the substituted judgment question assumes a certain kind of coherence and it assumes a certain kind of value that may obtain in some cases, but I don't know that we should assume it, it obtains in all cases. And it might well be that patients, you know, if they survive would thank us for not doing what they would have wanted. So th that, that, that one I'm especially concerned that we take for granted. How many of you would let the patient with anorexia starve herself to death? She presents, she understands everything about her disease. And she just says, yeah, I'd rather die than have to gain weight. And as I say, I know in practical terms, it's gonna be really hard to, to treat her long-term, but that's not the question. The question is how many of you think that she's morally entitled just in virtue of the fact that she has this belief that you think is totally wrong. I should say, in an, it's interesting that, um, I forget whether, which area of the lower gap of Whistler wrote another article about decision capacity in which 
they, in a single sense, talked about a patient, Amalekia, and said that the reason to treat her is that she has mistaken beliefs and listed that no one would like her if she wasn't thin, a, fa a mistaken factual claim. And then something like that, um, that there is nothing of value other than being thin. That's a mistaken normative claim that the patient has. And they were putting them together as if they were the same. Um, and that's, to me, that's where the clinician's good sense this patient needs to be treated um, is not finding the right kind of articulation because they don't want to admit that what's going on is a value judgment. I am curious. Come on. Yeah. I'll let this patient on. Why not? Yeah. So is there nothing she could say to show that she has insight, but merely that her values are wrong? That's, I guess, part of what I'm asking. You know, like, really are, what I've noticed is that this occasion, we make judgments about it. And then we try to re describe it in another way to give them comfort. Really, what I'm impressing is not in the philosophical literature of things stopping. It's not been taken for granted that either of the values that are at the basis of what we do every Wednesday and what you all do every day um, admits of no exceptions. What's, what's striking to me is that to see, so you take the case of the person who is you know, he's sort of on the way to starving. And we say that's a manifestation of mental illness and therefore the patient lacks capacity. Um, but if someone says, I don't want a blood transfusion, and, and that will lead to my demise, we say that they're exercising their religious beliefs. And, and we say, OK. Yeah, and that's, that's... And, and so it, it almost is that because enough people believe it, it now has a status of religious beliefs as opposed to psychic. Well, and we're, we're going to do the same thing with other contexts, with the patient who needs an amputation and says, I'd rather, even though we know that, you know, from all the data, they'll come back to their baseline of happiness, we say, okay, we'll let you die. There's a real question. What I'm trying to raise is why do we do that? Is it obvious that this is the case? And for instance, you know, supposing um, that we compel treatment for this young person with many years left of life, would it make it okay to do that if then two years later they thank us, like your patient? Uh, 
And so to what extent do we feed over parents and that's not necessarily mental parents, but rather it's just a you know a tool for, for writing. Yeah, I mean, I unfortunately, I mean, that's a difficult one because prisoners don't necessarily. I mean, uh, I'm I'm sorry that uh, we don't have Anne here about to, to talk about uh, the military. There are contexts in which people don't have the legal authority to say no necessarily. Uh, we might think that's wrong, but it 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 creates a different context for when judgments are made about when to to treat against objection. Um, but I guess, I guess in general, so there, we could take a step back here. And this is why I say that really what I'm trying to do is to raise the question as to whether we should be rethinking the model, not changing it immediately or clinical practice. Most of, one of the things that happens in, so to speak, the real world is that there's a temptation to say, that the morally right thing to do is the thing which follows from applying one rule in a consistent manner rather than another. And so the justification, for instance, for allowing patients to refuse treatment um, or for using a certain notion of substituted judgment might be that that's, if we follow that rule, there will be cases where intuitively we're, we don't like the outcomes. But if we follow a different rule, there will be worse, more cases where we don't. And so it may be that you that that's the best that we can do. But even that requires us then still to think through, do we have a different model that we could look at? And the challenge also, and this is sort of the challenge of this, that's the, the what I just described as rule consequentialism. It's focusing on the consequences of using one rule rather than another. The problem with rule consequentialism and the reason people often like to talk about rights with our current model is that it's been well known that it doesn't make sense to abide by a rule when you have sufficient confidence that violating it in this case will lead to the better consequences and won't have ripple effects on next ones. So that's our, so we are, what I'm trying to point out is that we are caught a little bit. The appeal to rights seems often to be mere table thumping when we say it overrides everything else. The alternative thinking in terms of this rule versus that rule is vulnerable to the thought that we sometimes have high confidence that we should violate the rule. So. And anyway, so 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 I think there's work to be done. Yeah, you know, if you think the subject is a rule, you can just drop the 
Seems to me that what the common man says of this is that uh, the times that the sword of Baal talks about is entirely correct. I mean, one therefore, what is not for that <clears throat> is a chaotic war. But in Joshua's case, then, in that case, the thing is entirely different. For example, who are the most rational person? I mean, you or something like that. You can make your decision everything you want. But if you come to my office, you want to commit suicide, I don't let you. You have lost your freedom because you are coming to my office asking me to help your illness. Then I sit in the box. And I wanted to go to my home, and I was a stage up, not very of time, behind another bar. And if I wanted to get out of the bar, no, I had lost my freedom. But I gave back my freedom when I am at the stage. Because once you are a physician, you have a different responsibility. You can't just say, okay, you have the freedom. I have the responsibility behind to this person being rational. And at the moment, because we are not always rational, our rationality changes. So I cannot apply those things to every single time, every case. So, what are the limits of your faith and what you can call them? This is one thing. I don't know if you want to. What I am saying. When a person comes in voluntarily, here, you need a new year. I say, if a person comes voluntarily, he wants to get better, and he wants to commit suicide, first of course, I have a duty to find out if he really rational or if it's not rational. But if he wants to go to commit suicide, he don't come to me. As a patient. In other words, go home, you have all the freedom that you have, but you cannot participate as a physician. I cannot participate in your freedom. I don't, I mean, I, I don't disagree, but I'm not sure that's what's at issue here. I think what's going to be at issue is whether you're entitled and under if so under what circumstances and what would justify it to either well let's just stick to compelling treatment of, of one form or another what what are the circumstances under which that would be appropriate
Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yep, I agree. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Uh,